Hey, everybody. Hey, Jacob. Okay. Good. How was your break? No, it was good. Caught up on work, relaxed a little bit. It's good. Spring break is always timed a lot better than fall break because it's uh, fall recess is always at the very end of the semester. And so it's good to have one kind of in the middle, which is spring break. So now, now we feel rested for the rest of the semester. Yeah, the spring break was nice. Um, I actually realized after the first few days, I was like, oh shit, I actually don't have to do anything. Nice. Because everything, all my, all my projects and stuff for my other classes are due at the end of April. Uh -huh. And then this one final project is not do until after the finals, so. Nice, nice. Uh, I pretty much, I mean, we do have our homework, but that's not due until the 11th, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I got a week to do that. So I actually got to relax for this break. This That's good. Nice. That's important. Always to give your mind a break. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm feeling the burnout at this point. I'm so many years in. It's just mm -hmm. hard to keep myself motivated. Sometimes. Yeah. For sure. For sure. The break was definitely necessary. That's good. How's it going, Dr. Tran? Hey, Chris, how's it going? It's going all right. How's your spring break? Uh, it was okay. Short. Definitely would like another week off. <laughs> I know, right? How about yourself? Yeah, same. It's uh, caught up on work, did a bit of research, caught up on sleep cool. a bit, but yeah, I could definitely use some more. Yeah, more sleep at least. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Anything exciting? Uh and not particularly. We just you know spent some spent some time with friends and family, and um, you know, just caught up on a lot of that stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, over Tuesday, uh, me and a few of the rocket team members, we drove up to Big Bear to get some uh, altitude and GPS data. Uh, -huh. uh it was it was fun. Um. It's, Spooky at best because it was a very dense fog. Couldn't see in front of us within five feet. So uh, oh, that is a big, yeah, there was a big yellow truck that decided to make a left turn in front of us. And well, I was able to catch it in time before we slammed right into it. 
oh my god dang <laughs> that's scary yeah but hey that was exciting <laughs> It's a little bit too exciting. I think that's yeah. kind of exciting that takes years off your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah, you went to Hawaii. Yeah, I'm sure it must have been really nice. Probably the most exciting thing that happened to me over spring break was watching Will Smith slap the uh, stuffing out of uh, out of Chris Rock, which is kind of sad just to kind of say. <laughs> but it was even more sad is that after that happened, um, it made me really want to go watch uh, Rush Hour Two clips, um, and so I started watching. I was like, man, I love Chris Rock, and then my wife's like, you know, Chris Rock and Chris Tucker are different people, right? <laughs> I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I really want to watch Rush Hour 2 now. But that wasn't Chris Rock. That was Chris Tucker in Rush Hour 2. <laughs> yep.
All right, it's 5.30, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? How was everyone's spring break? Hopefully everyone was able to uh, rest a little bit or enjoy uh, a bit, okay? Um, so today, uh, we're gonna continue where we left off. Seven more weeks, that's right. When you say it like that, it seems like a long time, but it's, it's gonna go it's gonna go by uh, very, quick, very, very quickly, uh, if I know anything about that. Um, all right, so let's see, the plan for today is we're gonna continue where we left off, um, talking about finite volume methods. And so we were applying it towards our diffusion equation. Um, and so I think right before the spring break, we left off, uh, right before we were talking about the MATLAB, uh, and I and I promise you that you know I I'm gonna I'm going to uh, go over the MATLAB code a little bit more carefully, um, you know today and and for the rest of the class uh, just because that that's kind of where I see a lot of people kind of uh, having a lot, lot of questions on the homework and so uh, since we're doing a whole new method I want to make sure I, I go over this first one um, you know uh, pretty carefully just so we're all on the same page just so you know the homeworks will be um, you know smoother from here on out. All right, um, and so speaking of homeworks, I, I did post homework five this morning. Okay. Uh, you can, uh, so technically, you know, you, you should be able to do homework five. Homework five is about all of, um, all of diffusion with finite volumes. Uh, and so you might not be able to do everything yet, especially the 2D stuff. Uh, but by the end of this week, you should be able to do everything on homework five, okay? And I forgot the due date, although I can just check it really quick. Let's say the due date for homework five. Due date for homework five is April 13th. And so April 13th is next Wednesday. All right, and so uh, so that's that's um, that's posted for you. So the, the format for the homework is has been the same as the last few homework, and so uh, problem one is going to be your conceptual question. Problem two is going to be your theory question, where I want you to derive kind of the uh, the algebraic equations, and then problem three will be the math stuff. And so you know, most of the homeworks in this class will kind of follow that same that same format. Okay. All right. Uh, so are there any questions I can answer before we get started today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. And so we were talking about finite volumes. Okay. Finite volume solutions to, diff to diffusion problems. Okay. Uh, and so just to kind of remind you, uh, actually, let me, let me go ahead and write out the example. So we are working on an example here, okay? And so our example is a simple 1D diffusion equation. And so we have a three, and then we have our second order derivative here. Okay? And this is equal to our source function, which is two X squared, okay? And our boundary conditions, our first boundary condition is we have a Neumann condition on the left-hand side. And so we have dP dx at x is equal to zero, okay, is equal to zero. And so we have a Neumann condition of zero on the left-hand side of the domain. And on the right-hand side, we have our, we have a Dirichlet boundary condition. Right? And we are interested in computing with the finite volume solution to this problem on the following grid. Okay? And so we have a four cell grid. And so we have um, our two endpoints here. Okay. And we have three, uh, three mid nodes here. Okay? Remember the key with finite volumes is that we're, we're no longer interested in the solutions at the nodes, but we're gonna be considering the solutions in our cells, okay? And so we're going to be considering each cell kind of by on its own, just like this. Okay. Where what we're solving for is actually the solutions in the middles of the cell. Okay. 
<clears throat> and so I'm not going to go through the entire you know derivation process again. You know, but after after going through the hand calculations, we ended up with the following system. And for this particular problem, since we have four cells, that means we have four unknowns that we need to solve for, right? So we need to solve for the solution values in the middles of each of those cells. Right? And so our linear system here is going to be four by four. And so we have our left-hand side matrix, just like we usually do. Okay. We have our solution vector here, which is phi one through four. Right? And so phi one through four, those are the values of our solutions in the middles of our cells, okay? And this is equal to our right-hand side, right-hand side vector, okay? And for this particular problem, we ended up with coefficients that look like the following. So we have minus one, one, zero, one, minus two, one, zero, zero, one, minus two, one, and then zero, zero, one, minus three. And on the right hand side here we have our solution we have our um, forcing vector and so we have a delta x squared divided by three this is multiplied by two x one squared okay. next we have delta x squared divided by three times two x two squared and delta x squared divided by three two x three squared and then in the last row, we have a delta x squared divided by three. Go ahead and expand this a little bit. Delta x squared divided by three times two x four squared. And then because of the Dirichlet boundary, we're going to uh, subtract 20 from that. Okay. All right. So that was the linear system that we obtained last time. And I want to I want to kind of uh, you know before we jump into the MATLAB code, the reason I'm I'm kind of uh, you know I'm highlighting this again is I want to give you I want to highlight kind of three use cases. Okay. We'll start with the simple ones because those are those are the ones kind of we that we first saw for. So these two rows here, you know, you can see that they have the same structure, and so they have three coefficients: a one, a minus two, and a one. And the right hand sides are the forcing, right? Remember, these are our interior nodes or interior cells, excuse me. And so interior cells, they have a neighbor on the left and the right. And so we're able to evaluate both, um, both integrals um, accordingly. Next, we have the top row here. Okay. You can see the top row has, has a little bit of a different structure than the rest. And so you can see the top row, instead of having a minus two in the diagonal, we have a minus one. Okay, and so this is one of our uh, our boundary cells, and in fact, the the boundary that it borders is a, a Neumann boundary. Okay. okay, so I'll call this our Neumann cell. Okay, and then finally, finally, we have the last one. Notice how in this one, this one's also slightly different than our interior cells, and in that on the diagonal entry, we have a minus three instead of a minus two. Okay? And remember that minus three came as a result of our Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay? And the fact that we have a minus 20 on the other side also comes from our Dirichlet boundary condition as well. Okay? All right. And so I, I highlight this because um, you know it's it's important to know as we jump into the code because the way the code is structured, you know, we're just like we just like we have been doing in, in the past, we're gonna have if statements that uh, that do have the code do different things depending on which cell that we're that we're bordering. Okay. And so I want you to think of have these three cells in mind, three these three types of cells in mind, you know, what their pattern looks like on the left-hand side matrix and the right-hand side forcing if, if applicable. Uh, and then we're going to see how that's translated into how that's translated into code. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So let's, let me let me go ahead and jump into the code. So let me go ahead and share my screen. 
Okay, so here we are. And this is the, not the one I wanna show you. That's for my, that's my grad students. Okay. okay, so here is the one I wanna show you and this is obnoxiously big. So let me go ahead and uh, make this a little bit smaller. Font. Six is big. Do eighteen. Okay, that's a bit better. All right, so here is the code. I uh, so I posted this code online, and so it's uh, it's there for you to um, uh, to view. Okay, and we're going to go through this code and and a little bit of the logic that I've uh, um, you know that I've used in establishing this this code. Okay. All right, so let's look at section one first. And so um, you know we're we're looking at a finite volume code. I, I believe this is the first one that we've looked at. Um, but the general structure of the code is, is still going to be the same as our finite difference codes. And so section one here, section one here is going to define um, all the simulation parameters. And so all the higher level, all the higher level parameters are going to be set in this section up, up here. Okay. And so first we have um, N. And so big N here is going to define the number of cells in our, in our domain. Right. If you want to set this to be the same as our, as our example, you can set this to four. Okay. Let me go ahead and do that. Here. Right, but remember the way that we design these codes is so that they can be flexible and they can adjust based on how many cells and how much uh, how much mesh um, density that we want. Okay. All right. Next, we have a familiar uh, familiar face, and so we have X. Okay. And so X here is the positions of all the endpoints on the mesh. Right? And so remember, our, our mesh is uh, comprised of nodes and cells. Right. And so if we have, if we draw our line right here. Each of the endpoints of the uh, each of the points that are on this on this line right here, you know, they have a coordinate associated with them, and so that's that's going to be our x here. Okay, and so that's actually the same as before. And so remember, with our finite difference codes, we also need to know the the locations or the, uh, the or the coordinates of the points in our grid. Okay. Okay. So all that is is fairly standard. You know, the only difference is that end here is defining the number of cells instead of the number of points, okay? And that comes into play when we define dx, right? So dx is the spacing in between the, in, in between the, uh, the grid points, okay? But for finite volumes, it takes a slightly different meaning. And so for finite volumes, one way that we can say is that, you know, first of all, we can say that this is the, the size of the cell, right? So how big each cell is in terms of the x coordinate, okay? Uh, but this also defines, you know, how far we are between each cell center, okay? And so even though it defines, you know, how far the endpoints are, the cell centers are going to be the exact same distance as well. So if we measure the distance from here to here, right, that's going to be dx just as the same as this distance is right here. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, we, uh, we define this a little bit differently because remember, you know, before the way that we define dx is we do one over n plus one, right? Uh, because before n used to refer to the number of grid points in our mesh, but since we have the number, but since now n is defining the number of cells, um, since it's defining the number of cells, then we just do one divided by n, and that's going to be the number of grid points in the um, or the the grid spacing in our in our mesh. Okay, and so it's a subtle difference, but you know it's it's uh, you know it's it does make, it does make an impact for um, you know for these calculations. Okay. Question. Yeah. Uh, for what is just the length of of the System. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So for this uh, for this problem, we assume that the distance between the two endpoints here is just one. So we have L is equal to one here. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you would have L. You would have L in this numerator right here. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. And so um, the next uh, the next thing that we have here is X C. And so this and so this is a new one. Okay. Okay. All right. So X, XC, if you read the tooltip here, is the location of all the cell centers. All right. And so that's a little bit different than the endpoints. Because let me go ahead and draw our, our, our grid again. Okay. Right. Because right now we already have a position vector. So our position vector is X right here. And so that tells us the positions of each of the endpoints in our, our grid. Okay. But for finite volumes, you know, we're not really interested in the endpoints. You know, what we're interested in is finding the solutions at the cell centers, okay? 
And so this one right here will be x1, this one right here will be x2, this one here will be x3, and the one at the end here will be x4, right? So for the four cells in our grid, right? And so in order to define things like the, uh, like the forcing function, we need to know what are the locations of those cell centers, okay? And so that's what I've done here. And so I've used I've used the same um, you know I've used the same um, you know function as the um, uh, as x up there. So I'm still using the lint space, but instead what I'm doing here is I'm offsetting a bit. So the lint so the lint space up here goes between zero and one. Okay. What I'm doing instead is that I'm starting the the first cell center at zero point five times dx. Okay. And so what that says is that the very first cell centered is going to be not zero, but it's going to be at half the grid spacing, right? And the reason for that is, you know, if we if we look at this and we know that the distance between here and here is dx, right? Because dx is the size of each cell. Then if we wanted to get the location of the center of this, it would just be dx divided by two, right? Or in other words, 0 0.5 times dx. And so that's why for this one, I, I don't start it at zero, but I started at one, 0 0.5 times dx, okay? Similarly, you know, if we go to the endpoint, right? So remember the way the lint space function works is that you, you give it the starting point, you give it the endpoint, right? Uh, and so the endpoint here similarly has to be adjusted as well. And so instead of being one, where one, you could say one is the coordinate of this, of this node right here, okay? We instead offset that by half a grid spacing. And so our endpoint here is not one, but it's going to be one minus dx over two. Right? And so that's why I have one minus 0 0.5 times dx for the second part here. Right? And the number of coordinates that we want is n, which is the number of cells. Right? So since we have n is equal to four, then the number of cell center locations that we want is n, which is four. Okay? All right. And so with that, uh, this xc vector, you know, which which we're going to use uh, later below. This is gonna be a vector that tells us all the locations of all the cell centers in our, uh, in our grid, okay? All right, uh, any questions on, on that? Okay. So this, so this is a big difference. And so, you know, before in finite differences, we didn't really care, you know, where the, uh, where the cell centers are or where the locations of the cells, right? Because we were just concerned with the grid points. But since, you know, we're now concerned with the, the cell solutions, we need to know where all the cell centers are. All right, so from here, you know, we have pretty standard stuff. And so we have, we define the left-hand side matrix and the right-hand side vectors. We have, we use the symbol with A and B, just as we usually do. And then we also are defining our diffusion coefficient K. Okay, so for this problem, our problem was three D squared X DX squared, or D X D uh, DX squared. And so because of that, our diffusion coefficient is three right here, okay? And so these are just kind of, you know, just kind of really standard stuff for these kinds of problems. Okay. All right. So from there, we we enter the, the main loop. Okay. And and it's important. And, it, and if you have it written down, the uh, the the linear um, the linear system from previously, you know, you can check it. You can check this loop here to make sure that it assembles the same the same matrix because you know that's that's what it should do. Right. Okay. So first of all, we see that we have a for loop here, and so we have a for loop. Uh, we say four i underscore cell is equal to one to n. Okay. And so this is important because it's, it's uh, this allows us to visit every single cell. And so you know just and so this is this is you know the same as the same as we did with finite differences, but instead of instead of visiting every single grid point, we're instead visiting every single cell. Okay. All right. And so on the first iteration of this loop, we're going to be visiting cell number one. Then on the second iteration, it'll be cell number two, three, and finally four. Okay. All right. And so now you can see we enter into this fairly large if statement. And so let's go kind of case by case here to see you know, what each of them do, right? And if you remember, you know, when, we, uh, when we wrote down the linear system by hand, you know, I made the distinctions of you know, these two middle cells here were for interior, the top one is for our Neumann boundary condition, and the last one is for our Dirichlet boundary condition, okay? And you can see those three cases here represented by our if statement. And so first we're gonna check if I cell is equal, equal to one, okay? And so if I cell is equal, equal to one, that means we're on the very left side of the domain, right? And so if we're on the very left side, that means we're bordering the Neumann boundary condition, right? Because if you go back to our problem statement, remember that our boundary condition on the left side is d phi dx 
is equal to zero, okay? At x is equal to zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and establish what the, uh, um, what the matrix coefficients are gonna be. And so at the I cell, I cell location, and so this is the diagonal one, uh, if you go back to your hand calculations, you can see that this is a, a minus one. Okay. <clears throat> and then we also go to the right neighbor. And so the right neighbor um, 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 value here is one. And so that's why we have I cell and I cell plus one. Okay. And then finally, what we have is the, uh, the right-hand side vector. Okay. And so the right-hand side vector for the first cell is, uh, if, you, if you look back to your notes, we have delta x squared divided by k, right? And so our k here is three because that's how we defined it. And so we can just do delta x squared divided by k. Okay? And then we have two times x1 squared. Remember, the x1 in this case is the location of the first cell center. And so notice how we're not using X here, we're using XC, right? This is important because, you know, XC, remember, is the vector that holds the cell center locations. And so, you know, we're actually not gonna use this X at all, I don't think. Yeah, we don't even use this, we don't even use this X vector at all. And so, um, can't get line up again. And so, you know, you'll see here that this X here, you know, we don't use it because we don't really care what, what the locations of the endpoints are. Okay? But what we do care about is the locations of the of the cell centers. And so that's why you see here we have X sub C at I cell raised to the second power. Okay? That's, that's what our source function, that's what our source function is. Okay. Um, and so you can see here that we've, we've basically completed the entire row for the first cell, you know, about, uh, boundary conditions and source functions and all. So this is kind of a, a trend for our finite volume codes. And, for, and so for the finite volume codes, you know, we're going to handle kind of everything in one loop. And so that's kind of why some people like finite volumes a bit better because it's kind of handled a lot more, um, you know, a lot more succinctly. And so you don't have, you know, five loops to do the interior and the boundary conditions and, and everything like that. So it's all kind of handled at, at once. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? All right, so let's go to the next uh, the next part of the if statement. So the next next part of the if statement is if i cell is equal equal to n, okay. And so if i cell is equal equal to n, that means we're at the end point of our grid, right? So we're at the very very right. And so uh, from the problem, we know that our rightmost cell borders the Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay? And so this is going to um, this is basically going to be for the last the last row in the matrix. Right? And so if we go back uh, off our uh, off our solution on paper. We know that the, the diagonal entry here is equal to minus three, okay? The off diagonal entry, which is one to the left of the diagonal is equal to one, okay? And so that's why we have A I cell comma I cell minus one is equal to one, okay? And then the right-hand side vector looks something like, like this, right? And so first we have a contribution from the, um, we have a contribution from the source term. And so the sort of contribution from the source term is DX squared divided by K multiplied by two times XC at I cell squared, okay? And so for this part, this XC at I cell is gonna be X4, okay? And of course we're gonna square it. And then we have a minus 20. And so this minus 20 is different from the other parts of the code because this, mi this minus 20 here comes from the Dirichlet boundary condition. No, no other, uh, uh, no other term here has it because you know there's only one Dirichlet boundary condition in this case. Okay. All right, and so that's the so, so that's the rightmost cell, and so finally we come to the um, to the interior nodes. Okay, and so the interior node, just like just like you know we always have, we make that the else statement. Okay? And so for the interior cells, we have a minus two in the, on the main diagonal, and we have uh, values of one on the left and right neighbors. And then we have our right-hand side forcing vector. Okay. 
right? And so this is the same as above. So we have dx squared divided by k multiplied by two times xc at i cell squared. And just like that, in just one loop, one loop through all the cells, we have every single, um, you know, the left-hand side matrix and the right-hand side vector complete. And so all we have to do left here is just solve, uh, solve our system. Okay. And so you can see, you know, the, the structure for this code is, is not all that different from, uh, from our finite differences. You know, we're still, we still have a lot of the main components. It's just that we made changes to different parts, you know, because we're looking at the volumes now or the cells instead of the grid points. Okay. And, it, it's a, and it's a different mindset to keep track of, because I think when, when we first learn finite differences, we know to think of things as the nodes, you know, the nodes are kind of everything. But for finite volumes, you know, the cells become the star. So, you know, it, it takes a bit of time to kind of get used to that, uh, that used to that thinking. Uh, you know, it, it might look like your solution doesn't look, doesn't look all that different, uh, you know, but it's, but it's an important distinction to, to make. And it'll become a lot more important to do that in, in 2D as well, which we're going to go over later today. All right, any questions on this before I run the code? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and run the code and see what it looks like. And so for this particular problem, I computed the, I computed the exact solution as well. And so we can see how well that they match up. Remember, we should get a second order accurate solution. And so, um, you know, we, might, we may not be that accurate with just four cells. But after those four cells, then we'll get uh, you know more accurate, um, you know more accurate solutions. Okay, so here are our two solutions, and so you can see here in blue we have our finite volume solution, and the red here is exact. And so you know because we only have four cells, you can kind of see them here. And so we have you know this is cell number one, right? This is cell number two, cell number three, and cell number four is like almost parallel to it as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and adjust our code and see how the accuracy changes when we change this to 40. Okay. Right, so now we have 40 cells in our grid instead of just instead of just the four. As you can see here, we get a much more accurate solution because the two uh, the two functions basically overlap each other perfectly. Yep. Why did the exact solution change? Good question. So uh, so the exact solution, let me go back to the, the four points here. And so just to make sure I can do an apples to apples comparison, so node by node, what I did was I, I plotted the exact solution against X, XC right here. Um, and so what we can do instead, let me do this. Let's do, oh, I shouldn't touch that. Okay. Let me do this. We'll do X2 is equal to min space, Zero, one, one. Okay. And instead of this, I'll do X2. And put this X2. All right. So now, so now they're not they're now they're going to be plotted off different X values. And so you can kind of see the, the difference between them. And so you can see here that uh, yeah, so so red here is the exact one. So because the finite volume one is only defined in terms of the cell centers, you can see here it's a little bit shorter. And so you can see kind of a more true kind of representation of how, how close it is. Yeah. And so if we change this back to, let's change this back to 40, you can see that they're going to be pretty close to each other. Yeah. And so now that they're, now they're almost the same on top of each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I did that because I, I think for this code, I was thinking of doing a, a node by node comparison to see what the errors are, but I kind of scrapped that idea. So um, yeah, that's why I forgot. All right, any questions on, on this? All right, and so, that, and so this code is posted on Canvas, and so this is available to you. And so you can definitely use this for your homeworks, right? Um, in particular, problem 3A, I think, follows this, follows this pretty close in. So I think you're just gonna have to modify this code for, for 3A, okay? Um, you know, but, but really take note of, of the subtle differences. And so it, it, may, it may not seem like um, that much, um, you know, because because the structure of this code looks the same as finite differences, but you know, all those really small subtle changes, you know, make a big difference. And especially once we get deeper into finite volumes, it's good to kind of build that intuition now of you know we're we're doing this for the cells and for the cell centers, okay? Because uh, as we go further and further along, our finite volume codes will look a lot different than our finite differences, and so that's a, that's an important distinction to uh, to make. Okay, so let me go back to our. Um, Notes here. Right. 
So that's 1D, uh, that's 1D diffusion. And so now let's go ahead and start talking about 2D diffusion with finer volumes. Yep. Uh, just kind of like to understand, like, so as we increase the cells, I mean, uh, yeah, the number of cells, we're basically having our center approach our boundary pressure conditions closer and closer. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That makes it more comfortable. Than that. Exactly. And then, uh, and then the cell centers are getting closer to each other as well. And so the more cells that you have, and you know, you're cramming more cells into it, the same amount of space, then DX is getting smaller and smaller. And so that's going to give you a much more accurate solution. Very similar to finite differences in that case. Okay. Uh, so now that we now that we have solved uh, you know, our first finite volume um, solution okay, in 1D, let's see how those same, um, same quantities or same ideas apply in 2D as well. Okay. And so our starting point, just like in 1D, is our 2D diffusion equation. Uh, but just like I've been doing with finite volumes, I'm, I'm going to put this in. Uh, I'm going to put this in vector form because it apply, it makes applying our integration rules a little bit easier. Okay. And so in vector form, our diffusion equation is going to be minus k times the uh, divergence of the gradient of phi, okay. and this is equal to our source term q of x and y. And so just as a reminder, this, uh, this right here is equal to um, partial squared phi, partial x squared, plus partial squared phi, partial y squared. Okay? And so this is basically the Laplacian of, of, of phi. Um, you know, but, I, but I put it in the vector form just to make it a little bit easier. Okay? All right, and so just like we did before, uh, we're going to take this equation here and integrate it over the cell. And since we're in 2D now, uh, the integral is now a double integral instead of a single integral, okay? And then we're going to apply some of our integration rules to help us out here, okay? So in particular, this side, okay? This side of the equation, which we have a, a double integral over a divergence, okay? What we can do is we can, we can transform this into a line integral using the divergence theorem. Because remember, you know, if we have a integral, double integral, over the divergence of something, what the divergence says, what the divergence theorem says is this is equal to a line integral around the back, around the edges of the cell. Okay. Of the gradient of that of that quantity dot dn. Or dot product with the end vector, which we'll go over in a second. Okay. And so visually it looks like this because the double integral, you know, if we have our 2D, our 2D um, area like this, okay, the double integral would be basically taking the integral and applying it over the entire area, right? So that's what the double integral does. But instead of doing that, you know, we can do a line integral instead, where instead of integrating over the entire area, we're integrating just along the edges. And we're going to use the compass directions to kind of define each of these edges. Okay, so we'll call this the north, the north edge. 
We'll call this the east edge. We'll call this the south edge. And we'll call this one the west edge, okay? And one thing I want to highlight here, you know, because it's going to be important, we haven't done anything with this n vector yet because it hasn't really been relevant in 1D. But what that n vector is, this is what's known as the outward facing unit normal. And so what it is basically, it's, it's a vector that, that lives on each of the edges of this, of this domain that faces outward, okay? And so for the north, the north edge right here, okay, the outward direction from the north edge is to go up, right? And so if you're, if you're kind of sitting right inside of the, right, sitting right inside of the cell, if you wanna go out, out the, out the top edge, you would go uh, up, right? And so our normal vector here is just a vector that just points upward just like that. On the east edge, right? If we want to head outward from the east edge, we would go to the right. Okay, so our, our outward unit normal is going to be pointed that way. For the south, our outward unit normal is going to point down. And on the west, our outward unit normal is going to point to the left. Okay. Right. And so that's going to be important when we when we actually define our, our integrals. Okay. And those four, those four sides of the square, the four edges, are going to be important for us evaluating our, our line integral. Okay, because normally when you evaluate a line integral, uh, you basically integrate around the entire the entire line. Okay, and so you would basically start at one edge or one one location, and you would integrate this way. Okay, and so you'd make kind of a an entire loop around. Okay, and during that entire loop, you're kind of integrating the function as you as you go along. The problem with that approach is that, you know, for our, for our particular cell, since our cell here is a square, you know, that requires kind of going around these sharp corners. Okay? And mathematically, that's hard to do, because if you, if you want to kind of um, characterize this line, right, part of the line integral is that you have to um, characterize, you know, or at least, or what we call parameterize the line that goes around your surface, right? And so we have to come up with some kind of function, you know, if we want to do this all in one shot, we have to come up with one function that goes, that follows the edge of this square, you know, exactly. Um, and that's hard, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to do the edges because they're straight lines, but turning this corner is, is really, really hard to do. Okay? And so what we do instead is that, you know, instead of, instead of doing one integral that goes around the whole thing, we instead take our line integral here and split it up into four. Okay. And so since our domain, since our domain is domain, great English, Justin. Okay. And so since our domain is a square, we can break up. Line integral. Into four pieces. And those four pieces are going to be, we're going to have one for each edge of our square. Okay. And so what we're going to start with is our integral that we're, the line integral that we're computing is a minus K. I kind of forgot it here just because I was demonstrating it, but you know, we still have this minus K out in front here. Okay. And so the integral that we want to compute is a complete line integral. Okay. And so, you know, if, if I haven't mentioned it yet, you know, that circle on the integral there means we have to integrate along, the, along a closed path. Okay. Uh, in other words, we have to, we have to go around the entire cell. Okay. So we have to start at one point, go around the entire thing and end up back at the same point. And so if we're going to if we're going to integrate along a closed path, right? 
we can't do this in just one path, or we can, but it's, it's, it's really hard because of the sharp corners. Okay. What we can do instead is we can break this up into four, um, four similar integrals. Okay. And so we can say is this equal to minus k, because k here is a constant, and so we're just going to leave it out in front. Okay. And so instead, we're going to have a single integral on the, uh, on the east face, okay. or the east edge, and this is going to be gradient of phi dot n hat ds, okay. And then we're going to have an integral for the north, the north edge, and so this is going to be an integral n of nabla phi dot n hat ds plus an integral for the west face. And so we have a integral for the west gradient of phi dot n hat ds plus finally one integral for the south. And so what this means is that in 2D, if you want to solve the finite, if you want to solve the diffusion equation for two in, in 2D finite volumes, um, oh, thank you, Kozbeck. Uh, if we want to solve the finite volume um, solution for 2D diffusion, that means we have to evaluate each of these four edge integrals. And so I, I want to kind of take my time with this, you know, just because it's it it is it is quite a lot of algebra. It is quite a lot of you know um, terms to write out. And so I, I'm going to take my time with this just to kind of make sure that you know you kind of see every single step and it's it's taken slowly. Uh, because once we start adding convection, once we start adding unsteadiness, um, this same the same thought process is still going to apply. And so we're going to apply these four integrals. The only difference is that these four integrals are going to get a little bit more complicated. And so. You know, with diffusion, diffusion is kind of the simplest thing that you can do. And so with diffusion, it's, it's a little bit easier to keep track of stuff. But I want you to kind of keep the kind of the big picture in mind of, of the process that we're going through of, you know, taking our 2D domain, which is a square. We're breaking, we're transforming it using divergence theorem. Then after we did divergence theorem, we're taking that line integral and splitting it up into four um, just to make it easier for us to, to integrate. Because um, once we get to once we get to convection, you know, it's going to follow the same process, but there's going to be some more terms floating around to make it a little bit harder to follow. Okay. Um, any questions on on any of this? Yep. The integrals are just a representation, right? They're not the complete. Uh, like, right there, how it's set up, it's really looking like with just the lower boundary. Yeah, so we're 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 gonna we're gonna work on this a bit more, and so yeah, definitely these integrals are not in their final form yet because you know when I say take the integral of gradient of phi dot n, that's still kind of math kind of jargon, and so we still have, we still have to work on this a bit more. Uh, but the reason I'm doing this too is because once we get to the boundary conditions, we're gonna take kind of the similar approach to the boundary conditions where you know we're gonna replace an entire integral here with 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 a boundary condition essentially. Yeah. But for the interior nodes, you know, we, we still have to work on this a bit more just to uh, get it in a just to get in a form that we can we can recognize. Okay. Um, and so with that, you know, let's let's actually interpret this first because right now this this gradient of phi dot n is um, you know it's it's kind of it's right now it's kind of meaningless and so we don't really know what it stands for. Right. We kind of have an idea what n is, you know, because I, I talked about it here. But let's see how that um, how that combines together with the gradient of phi. Okay. Okay. And so let me start up by saying that you know this uh, this symbol here where we have the gradient of phi, right? That's what it stands for. Okay. 
And what it is, this is, this is essentially a, a vector quantity. And so if you, uh, I'm not sure if you covered grad gradients in a previous class, you might've seen it in 308, you know, many, many moons ago. Uh, but when you take the gradient of a function, basically what you're interested in is what's the, what's the rate of change of that function in each direction of your, um, of your system. Okay. And so in 2D, we have two principal directions. And our two directions are the x direction and the y direction. And so the gradient, the gradient seeks to compute what the rate of change of phi is in the x and the y direction. And so mathematically, the gradient of phi here is equal to partial phi, partial x, comma, partial phi, partial y. Okay. All right, so that's what the gradient of phi is, and you know, and you can start, and you can start to see, you know, we're getting into um, parts that look a little bit familiar because we're we're starting to get derivatives. Here. You know, we like to see kind of derivatives in these solutions. Okay. What we're computing in our integrals is the dot product between uh, gradient of phi and the normal vector. Right, we're taking the dot product between two vectors. And remember, when we take the dot product between two vectors, we end up with the scalar at the end. Okay. What's going to be important here is that you know the end vector, the outward facing normal, is different for each face. Okay. And so I'll give you an example here. So let's start with the east face, right? So the outward unit normal for east is a vector that points east, right? And so if we were to if we were to kind of um, quantify this in terms of a vector a vector with a with a magnitude of one, you know, it would just simply be a horizontal vector. And so it would be, you know, one way that we can um, compute it is we can say that the n hat is just one comma zero, okay? Because the if we look at this vector here, we can see that the x coordinate here is one and the y coordinate of that vector is zero, okay? Right. Similarly, if we look at the, 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 north, the north edge, okay? and so for the north edge, we have a vector that's pointing straight up. That's the normal vector. Okay? And so this tells us that the n hat for this one is 0, 1, right? Because its y coordinate is 1, but its x coordinate is 0. That's because it's facing vertically, vertically upwards. All right, so for the west, for the west um, edge, you know, we have a vector that's pointing to the left. And so if we have a vector that's pointing to the left, its normal vector would be minus one comma zero. And then finally for the south, for the south edge, we have a vector, our outward unit normal is pointing down. And so this tells us that our n hat here is zero comma minus one. Okay. And so now that we know what the gradient of phi looks like, and now that we know what each of the normal vectors look like, let's take their dot products. Okay? 
And so I'll show you a couple just to just to kind of give you a sense. But then um, you know I'm just going to put the rest of them in after that. Okay. So let's start. Let's start with the east face. Okay. And so for the east face, we have the dot product between partial phi partial x, comma partial phi partial y. Okay. We're going to dot product this with the vector one comma zero. Okay. And so this means we're going to have partial phi partial x multiplied by one plus partial phi partial y. Multiply by zero. Okay. Of course, the second term in that expression, because we're multiplying by zero, is just going to go away. And all we're left with is partial phi partial x. Okay. And so that tells us that our integral here on the east edge, okay, of this, right? So we have partial phi or gradient phi dot product with n ds, okay? This is the same thing as the integral on the east edge, okay, of partial phi, partial x, okay? And since, since our line is vertical here, we can replace D, ds with dy. Okay. Let's do another example. So let's do the south, the south edge, right? And so for the south edge, we're going to have the, um, the gradient of phi. Okay. The gradient phi is still the same. And so it's um, partial phi, partial x, comma, partial phi, partial y. And we're going to dot product that with the outward norm, unit normal for the south, right? And so the outward unit normal for the south is 0, comma, minus 1, OK? And so we dot product with this, we have a zero multiplied by partial phi partial x plus a minus one multiplied by partial phi partial y. Okay. We evaluate that dot product, and what we get is a minus partial phi partial y. Okay. And so therefore, our integral on the south edge of uh, gradient of phi dot n hat ds is equal to the integral of minus partial phi partial y dx. Okay. Okay. And so we can apply that same logic. Um, we can apply that same logic to all the integrals in our expression. And then that's going to give us a, a much simpler, uh, a much simpler expression that we can evaluate. Okay, so if we apply this to all the integrals in the diffusion derivative, what we get is minus k closed line integral of gradient of phi dot n ds. Okay. Right. So remember, first thing we did was we broke this up into four integrals, one for each of the edges of our of our cell. Okay. And then if we apply, if we actually apply the dot product, then we get the following. We have a minus k multiplied by integral on the east edge of partial phi partial x dy plus integral on the north edge partial phi partial y dx okay, minus integral on the west partial phi partial x dy minus integral on the south partial phi partial y dx And so that simplifies things, you know, greatly. And so, you know, we don't have any gradients floating around anymore. We don't have any normal vectors. We basically combine them in order to get this in terms of, of function derivatives. Okay. All right. So we're not quite there yet. There's there's one more step that we have to do, or a couple more steps before we get uh, before we get an algebraic equation out of it. 
Uh, but let me pause here for a second. So there, are there any questions on, on any of this? Okay. All right. Um, and so we're at, we're at this point now. And so we have their four integrals here. Okay. Uh, but they're not quite about, we can't quite evaluate them. Yet, okay. And so let's go ahead and, and reach into our bag of integral tricks again. Okay. And this time we're going to use our other trick, which is our trapezoidal rule. Remember, the, the way our trapezoidal rule works is that if you have an integral that you don't want to, that you don't want to integrate, that you don't want to take the, um, you know, the, take the antiderivative, uh, in this case, we physically can't because we don't know what phi is, okay? What you can do instead is you can evaluate the integrand at the centroid of the, of the, uh, of the integration domain and then multiplied by the length, okay? Good question. Yeah. Uh, why is it that... Uh, I guess east and west and north and south uh, don't cancel out. Um, that's a good question because they because they're taking place on different uh, on different faces. They're taking place in different locations, and so it looks like you know it looks like these are you know mathematically similar. But because this is happening on the east and the west, you know phi might change in between those two locations. So if you look at you know here and here then phi might be different in there. And so even though symbolically they look the same, um, you know, because phi is going to be different those locations, then they're, they're going to end up being, being different. Oh, I see. Because like our origin is probably like at that left corner. Exactly. Part, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so just to kind of remind you what the, what the trapezoidal rule states, states is that, you know, one way that you can approximate integrals is that you can take your integrand, evaluate it at the centroid of the domain, okay? And then multiply it by the size of that domain itself, okay? And so to kind of illustrate that, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, I know we've been kind of doing a lot of uh, math and uh, integrals here, but let me go ahead and draw the, draw the cell again. And so here's our cell. So here is our north edge. Here's our east edge. Here's our south edge and our west edge. Okay. And let's take the first integral there. So the first integral is we want to integrate on this edge right here. Okay. So we're going to go from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. Okay. So let's go from bottom. So we're going to go from bottom to the top. Okay. And then as we go from bottom to top, you know, we're going to integrate partial phi, partial x in there. Okay. Okay. And so that's hard to do because, you know, we, we don't know what partial fee partial X is. And so what we can do instead is we can say that the integral on the east edge of partial phi partial x dy, okay? What we can do instead is we can say that this is equal to partial phi partial x evaluated at the east edge of centroid, okay? And so this point right here is the centroid of the east edge, okay? And so I'll call that uh, partial phi partial x at e, okay? 
And we're going to multiply this by the length of this edge. And so, you know, because it's a 1D, a 1D integral, we just multiply by length. And so we're going to say that the length of that edge there is going to be delta y. Okay. All right. And so what that's going to allow us to do is that it's going to allow us to replace our integrals with these expressions here, which are mostly mostly algebra. Um, we're gonna we're gonna plug in for the for the derivatives in a second, but you know at least at this point we can get rid of the we can get rid of the integrals. Okay? And so let's go ahead and apply this trapezoidal rule to all four of our integrals. And we end up with the following. So if we do that, we get a minus k partial phi partial x value at the centroid of the east base, okay, delta y plus partial phi partial y at the north edge multiplied by delta x, okay, minus partial phi partial x on the west. The west edge multiplied by delta y minus partial phi partial y on the south edge multiplied by delta x. Any questions on how we got to uh, how we got to this point here? Okay. We're almost there, I promise. This is this is this is one of the more painful parts of the class. I know. Okay. And so at this point, you know, we we're we're getting there. You know, our goal our goal for this is to obtain an algebraic expression. Um, you know, because that's that's always the goal with these kinds of um, finite difference or finite volume uh, methods. Okay, the last hurdle standing in our way are these derivatives here that we have uh, in front of us. Okay, and so uh, what we're going to do is we want to replace these derivatives. Okay, right, and we want to replace them with some algebraic expression. Because once we do that, then we'll, we'll have obtained our algebraic equation that we can apply for, uh, for finite volumes. Okay? And to help with that, let me go ahead and, and expand, our, uh, expand our network a little bit. Okay? And so here is our cell. Okay? So this is the cell that we've been working on this whole time. Okay? And the uh, point that I'm drawing the center here, that's the value of the solution at that center. Okay. Remember, we we uh, when we do finite volumes, we do cell-centered finite volumes, and so that means the solutions that we solve for are in the centers of our cell. Okay. And so I usually call this uh, this value phi sub c um, for the center for the center value. Okay. In addition to our center cell, you know, remember this cell is part of a greater a greater finite volume mesh. Okay. And so we're also going to have um, neighbors on each of the four sides. Okay. And so we have our north neighbor, we have our east neighbor, we have our south neighbor, and we have our west neighbor was a little bit sad at first, but now I've made his house a little better. And then we have our west neighbor as well. Okay, so we have phi n, phi e, phi s, and phi w, in addition to phi sub c. Okay. Um, but just to kind of you know make things a bit clear, you know, remember what we're doing is we want to obtain an algebraic expression for phi sub c for cell c right here.
And so phi sub c here, that's our that's the protagonist in our story, and everyone else is just supporting characters. Okay. And so do you remember what we did in 1D? And so in 1D, we kind of had a similar issue where we had these kind of derivative terms in our expression, and we needed to kind of plug in for them, um, you know, in order to get our algebraic switch. Okay. And so we're going to do the same thing here. And so remember, the way that we took care of these derivatives in 1D was we made the assumption. Okay, we made the assumption that as you as the as the solution goes from one cell to the next, the variation is linear. Okay, so we're going to assume a linear variation of the solution. from one cell to the next. Okay. And so that means that these, that these derivatives that we have here, these derivatives are just gonna be the rate of change um, of the solution as you go from one cell to the next, okay? And in particular, we can say that they represent the slope of the line um, as you go from one cell to the next. And so these expressions here are actually going to be are, are going to mirror finite differences quite a bit. And so, for example, we have partial phi partial x on the east edge. Okay. And so this is the first this is the first derivative that we need to evaluate for our expression here. Okay. One way that we can represent this is this we can do phi sub e minus phi sub c divided by the um, space in between. And so, you know, if we assume an even grid spacing then this is going to be delta x, okay? And so similarly, if we take a partial phi partial y at the north face or in the north edge, okay, then we can express this as phi sub n minus phi sub c divided by delta y, okay? And then the uh, the derivative of the solution on the west on the west edge is going to be phi sub c minus phi sub w divided by delta x. Okay. Okay. And then finally, we have um, partial phi partial y on the south on the south edge is phi sub c minus phi sub s all divided by delta y, okay? And so now that we have that, um, you know, we have these algebraic expressions for each of these derivatives, we can go ahead and plug this into our expression, our expression above, okay? And so if we do that, we get a minus k, okay? First thing that we had was a partial phi partial x. And so let's go ahead and plug that in. So we have phi sub e minus phi sub c all divided by delta x. Okay. okay. And so if we scroll back up here, you know, that's uh, that's we just plugged in for this as well. Okay. But that's not the only thing that we have there. We also have to multiply by delta y. Okay. okay. And so that's where that delta y comes from. We're going to do the same thing for the north derivative. And so for the north derivative, we have phi sub n minus phi sub c divided by delta y multiplied by delta x. Okay. Then we have the derivative on the west, on the west edge. And so that's phi sub c minus phi sub w all divided by delta x. And then we're going to multiply that by delta y. 
And finally, we have the expression on the on the south. And so that's P sub C minus P sub S uh, divided by delta Y. And that's going to be multiplied by delta X. Any questions on how we obtained this uh, this part here so far? Okay. All right, so we're, we're just about there. Um, let me go ahead and make an assumption here, uh, one that we usually make. And so let's assume that delta X and delta Y are the same. And so we have an even grid spacing in the X and Y directions. You know, which is pretty reasonable for most of this class. And so if we assume that, then all of these are going to cancel out. Okay. Uh, which is nice because that simplifies things quite a bit. Okay. And then once we do that, we can finally simplify our expression here. Okay. We can simplify and it's, it's going to look very, very, very familiar. Okay. All right, so we simplify this, we get a minus K and then we have a phi sub E plus phi sub N plus P sub W plus P sub S minus four P sub C. Okay. All right. uh, so maybe this pattern looks familiar because remember when we did our diffusion with 2D, uh, when we applied finite differences to our diffusion equation, we got the same pattern. And so we had a coefficient of one in front of all our neighboring, uh, and at the, at the time it was our neighboring nodes. But in this case, we have neighboring cells, right? And so we have a coefficient in front of one in front of our east neighbor, our north neighbor, our west neighbor, and our south one, okay? And then for the cell in question or the centered cell, uh, we have a coefficient of minus four. And so, you know, this matches up very closely with what we got with finite differences. Um, which is great, you know, because remember finite differences, finite volumes, they're both trying to solve the same problem in a very similar way. And so the fact that we got similar coefficients here, you know, is, is encouraging to see. Okay. Okay, and so before before we sign off for today, let's go ahead and plug this back into our plug this back into our equation because remember there's there's one term that we kind of forgot all this time, which is our source term. Okay, okay. and so on the one side of the equation we have a minus k times phi sub E plus phi sub N plus phi sub W plus phi sub S minus four phi sub C, okay? And this is equal to the double integral of our source term dA, okay? And so for the source term, you know, um, you know, you're probably thinking, oh no, here we go again. You know, divergence theorem, trapezoidal rule and all that stuff. Um, luckily for this, this is this is easy to evaluate because this we're just going to simply use trapezoidal rule. Because okay. most of the time for most problems, you're going to be given Q. And so you can just go ahead and trapezoidal rule that right away. Okay. And so trapezoidal rule in 2D, we evaluate our integrand here, which is Q. We evaluate it at the centroid of our cell. And so that's X sub C, Y sub C. And then we multiply it by the area of the cell. Okay, so this delta squared here, this is the area of the cell. Okay, assuming that delta x and delta y are the same. And so we bring that together with our expression above.
we get the following expression. And so this right here is our uh, 2D finite volume uh, equation for pure diffusion. And so this equation here, we can apply to every interior cell. And so as long as the cell has neighbors on all four sides, we can use this equation here to obtain its algebraic, its algebraic equation. Okay. All right, any final questions on this before we wrap it up for, for today? All right. All right. All right. So uh, I know I went over for a little bit. So thank you guys for, for staying for a bit. Uh, and so on Wednesday, we'll pick this up again and we'll talk about boundary conditions. Okay. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening and I will see you all on Wednesday. Thanks guys. Yep. Out of curiosity, I think I don't know if you mentioned this uh, one in the class, but do we have like different types of cell geometry as well? We could. Yep. In theory, you can have any kind of cell geometry. So it works for uh, for anything. Um, of course, you know, the ones, the simple ones like squares and triangles are probably the most practical. Um, but you can apply this method to, to any to any kind of geometry. Yeah. It's like finite elements. So finite elements, you have a lot of different element shapes. And they all have different kind of properties, and they work well in different situations. Um, so this you can you can apply to almost anything. Mm -hmm. Thanks.